Hello everyone and welcome. 1,000 horsepower in a naturally aspirated, street legal, emissions compliant engine that is going in the Aston Martin Valkyrie. So that is going to be the main topic of this video and we're also going to look at another engine used in the Gordon Murray T50 which in many ways is the successor to the McLaren F1 which also has a very impressive naturally aspirated very high revving over 12,000 RPM uh, engine going in it. Now both of these engines are naturally aspirated. Both of these engines are V12s. They're both at a 65 degree angle. They both rev well past 10,000 RPM and they're both made by Cosworth. So it's very easy to be like, oh, those are similar. Hence, I put the two together in a video. But in reality, they're completely separate projects and you should not think of them as being related. So let's start off with the Aston Martin Valkyrie. Again, this is a 65 degree naturally aspirated V12 engine. It is 6.5 liters, so it is certainly a healthy size. Here we have a simplified diagram of what this engine looks like. It's producing 1,000 horsepower at 10,500 RPM and 546 pound-feet of torque at 7,000 RPM and revs all the way to 11,100 RPM. Now, air is going to come from the front of the car, which will be up here. It will then come back, then be routed into each side of this intake plenum. So I've kind of split how this is drawn. Uh, we're kind of looking above the engine here and then somewhat inside the engine on this side here. So that air will come back from the front of the car from a hood scoop and then be routed through the two throttle bodies into the intake plenum and then sent down through each of those six individual runners on each side going to each cylinder bank. And so then those exhausts are split, uh, they don't all go into one. And so when they were actually developing this engine, they made an inline three cylinder engine to see if they could get it to rev at these high RPM, make the power that they wanted and still be emissions compliant using a single catalytic converter with that three cylinder. And it worked out, so then they scaled up, and you now have a V12, so four sets of these three-cylinder engines, and then each has its own catalytic converter, so four of them total before everything ends up going to the back. Now, one of the unique challenges with this engine, of course, the Aston Martin Valkyrie is designed to be as light as possible. And so as a result, the engine is used as a structural member of the vehicle, so it's actually what holds together the front and the rear of the car. In doing so, you kind of simplify things, you allow the engine to serve multiple purposes. Not only is it powering the vehicle, but it's also structural, so you can help reduce weight. But the challenge then, of course, is the stresses put on that engine. And so, as you can imagine, this is also a very high downforce vehicle. So, Aston Martin's saying about 4,000 pounds of downforce being pressed down on this vehicle. So, on top of its own weight, your vehicle suspension is holding that car, and then it's also carrying the load of that downforce. And so you have that pressure uh, with both of these wheels pushing up, and basically what they're doing is they're forcing the top of this engine to be compressed, and the bottom of that engine is in tension. Basically, it's just trying to take the engine and throw it out the bottom. So there's a lot of stresses being placed on this engine, and so that's kind of some of the unique challenges there of keeping it light, but also making sure it can handle all of that stress. Uh, and they were able to keep the weight at about 450 pounds, a little over 200 kilograms, which is quite impressive. Now, as far as how this engine actually creates a thousand horsepower, there's three things I wanna focus on. First being displacement. Size, of course, does matter for engines. Second, I'm going to talk about brake mean effective pressure. And then third, we're going to talk about RPM. The higher you can get that engine to rev, the more power you can make. So starting off with displacement, this is a 6.5 liter engine, 1,000 horsepower means it's making 153.8 horsepower per liter, which beats everything else naturally aspirated before it by a long shot. Now, they haven't released what the actual dimensions of these cylinders are, which I was very curious about to see how fast these piston speeds were actually in there. However, in an interview with Carfection, Cosworth revealed that their piston speeds are somewhere between 25 and 26 meters per second. Those are the average piston speeds. So we can use the simple formula for average piston speed equals two times stroke times RPM divided by 60. And that allows us to calculate what the stroke would be. So it's gonna be somewhere between 67.6 millimeters and 70.3 millimeters. So a fairly short stroke, which is fairly obvious, it would have a short stroke and that way it can rev up really high 
The bore using volume equals pi r squared times stroke, you can calculate to be somewhere between 101 and 99 millimeters. So your pistons, uh, the stroke path that they actually travel and their bore, somewhere in between this range right here. Next, let's get into brake mean effective pressure. Now, if you haven't yet watched my video on brake mean effective pressure, I'd highly recommend doing so. But ultimately, we're looking at this vehicle here has a peak BMAP of 14.3 bar at 7,000 RPM, and that comes down to about 13.1 at its peak power, which is at 10,500 RPM. And 14.3 is very good, but it's nothing unheard of. So, you know, it's not like this engine is breaking any laws out there. It's well within normal regions for a good naturally aspirated engine. And the key to all of this is really optimizing that airflow for the engine. So as you have that intake air coming in and then passing into this intake manifold, you're going to have all these different pistons, of course, with your intake valves opening and closing. And what you want to make sure happens is as you have that air rushing to go in an engine cylinder and then you close that intake valve, that of course creates a high pressure area as all that air is being thrown this direction and then a valve says, nope, you're not getting in. So you create that high pressure region and that high pressure region starts bouncing around in this intake manifold. And you want to time that so that that high pressure region then passes over and works perfectly with a cylinder that is just opening its intake valve. So you have that high pressure occur right when the intake valve opens, you force in a little bit extra air within that cylinder and you're able to make more torque per liter. Moving on to our third element here, RPM. So power is a function of RPM. If you hold everything else constant and you're able to rev higher, you will make more power. And so for this vehicle, we are making 546 pound-feet of torque at 7,000 RPM. We can calculate how much power that is, 546 times 7,000 RPM divided by 5252, and that gives us 728 horsepower at 7,000 RPM. And kind of really cool what happens with this engine as each 1,000 RPM that you add, if you rev up to uh, 8,000 RPM, you're a little bit above 800 horsepower. And if you rev up to 9,000 RPM, well, you're just below 900 horsepower. So basically with this engine, if they're able to contain and keep that uh, brake mean effective pressure high, then they're able to add 100 horsepower for every 1,000 RPM they can add. So by the time it gets to 10,500 RPM, it is capable of producing 1,000 horsepower. And you know, this sounds crazy because the number is higher than other vehicles that we see. But if you were to think about a two liter engine revving to 5,500 RPM, making 160 horsepower, it wouldn't sound all that crazy. And this is actually representative of what this is. All we're doing is nearly tripling the size of the engine and then doubling the RPM, thus doubling the airflow. And then because it's three times the size, this is over you know, six times the airflow. Another interesting feature of this engine is that the camshafts are actually gear driven rather than using a timing belt or a timing chain. And this simply has to do with how high the thing is revving. So it's revving to 11,100 RPM using a chain at those speeds can be a bit risky uh, so it uses a gear driven system so ultimately you have your crankshaft which will eventually work its way to the camshaft the camshafts will be rotating at half the speed of that crankshaft uh, so this is actually fairly common for race engines it's just less common with road engines and one of the interesting things about how they implemented it is that it's actually at the back of the engine usually you will find these uh, timing gears you would it would make more sense for them to go at the other end of the engine for packaging reasons it would keep things a little bit shorter uh, but because that would be right behind the driver you'd have these gears all right behind the driver sitting in that cockpit the nvh the noise and vibration this wouldn't be ideal to have right behind that driver when you'd rather probably hear that screaming engine than some gear backlash uh, so they have moved that to behind the engine so it's further away from the driver uh, isolating that noise a bit more and allowing you to hear the things that you really want to hear now something absolutely Absolutely fascinating about this engine is that it only uses port fuel injection it does not have direct injection and so the reason they said they did this is because when they use direct injection they had to have a particulate filter in the emissions equipment in order to compensate for it uh, however they found that with port injection uh, they could meet their power targets 
and not have uh, that particulate filter. So they went with port injection. What's interesting is that you just very rarely see this with really high performance engines. Uh, and there's a reason for that. So you may see engines use both uh, that are, you know, real high performance engines using both port and direct. But often what happens is once you get up into the high RPM region, once you get into that high load region, they're only using this direct injector. And reason being is there's a cooling effect. And so when you choose between port and direct, you're choosing where you want that cooling effect to happen as that fuel changes from a liquid to a vapor. And so if you have it happen within the cylinder, like with direct injection, you cool the temperatures within that cylinder and as a result you're able to reduce overall temperatures and which means you're allowed to use more ignition advance which allows for you to make more power. You don't run into engine knock so it's a really safe way to make lots of power. Using port injection you also have that cooling effect obviously but it happens before the air gets into the engine so what you're doing is you're creating denser cooler air that you're then putting in the engine so you can put a little bit more of it you can put a little more air and fuel in however that cooling effect happened outside so your overall temperatures because you've packed in a little more air and fuel are still going to increase and so because of that uh, you have a slight tendency to have run into knock a bit more meaning you can't use quite as much timing so there are performance benefits to going just direct injection uh, however in this case they have gone with just port injection in order to make this thing meet emissions targets so i am curious what the compression ratio is of the engine they have not released this uh, so it will be interesting to see what it is but i imagine it might be slightly lower than some of the top end engines out there simply uh, because we know it's running port injection and because these brake mean effective pressures are within you know a, a reasonable range so cool nonetheless and many of you may wonder well what's the reliability of something like this going to be and their target uh, is a hundred thousand kilometers an actual target of this is how long we want it to last and then after that it's probably you know not the best it's not going to be broken uh, but they would assume you might replace it at sixty thousand miles and that may not sound like much but if you consider what this engine is doing how high it's revving the kind of power it's making uh, that's a very impressive number because race engines aren't going around for sixty thousand miles uh, and this is very close to what this is you know Pretty impressive that you can go that long uh, and maintain this kind of performance. And then after that, sure, uh, you've got to replace it. But if you're, you're paying for a car in this category, uh, you're probably not too worried about having an engine only last 60,000 miles, which is quite a long time. It's, it's a couple road trips. So finally, let's discuss this Gordon Murray T50, the successor to the McLaren F1. And they claim this is a 3.9 liter, 65 degree, naturally aspirated V12 engine revving to 12,100 RPM. So another 1,000 RPM over what this one was doing, though in a smaller package. Now I put quotes around 3.9 liters because it's really a four liter engine. If you look at uh, the cubic centimeters, this is a 3.98 liter engine. So I think they didn't want to call it a four liter engine. Uh, so it isn't quite four liters, but if you were to round, you would never round 3.98 to 3.9 so either way uh, it's basically a 4 liter v12 smaller of course than this one here but revving higher and because it revs higher that actually does give them a power per liter advantage so 650 horsepower divided by 3.98 about 163 horsepower per liter rather than that 153.8 so uh, this shattered everything before it and then this comes along not too long after and blows it out of the water. Now in an interview with Top Gear, Gordon Murray said one of the really cool things about the McLaren F1 was how quickly it revved while in neutral. So he said it could jump 10,000 RPM per second, uh, which was kind of a, a target that he wanted to say, you know, for this engine, I also want to make sure it has that really high revving, happy revving nature. There is no flywheel on this engine, uh, it just goes straight to the clutch. And so the interesting thing here is that instead of 10,000 RPM jumps 
per second. It is capable of 28,000 RPM per second. Now, of course, it doesn't rev that high. It just revs to 12, uh, but it just means it takes a fraction of a second if it's in neutral to rev up. So it behaves like a really tiny engine as far as how quickly it revs, uh, but you know, it's a, it's a four liter V12. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, so both of these very cool engines. Hope you all have enjoyed watching. If you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.